Our scripture today is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge you uh, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you, praise team, and thank you, Phil. First Timothy chapter 2 is where we're at today, First Timothy chapter 2. I don't know if you guys are um, feeling any kind of appreciation this morning, but um, Purdue loosened up Michigan for you, so we didn't really do anything, but we loosened them up, so it should be all good to go by the time you guys get to them. Uh, if they make it that far, apparently they're scandal, who knows. Um, it's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, if you're like me, you're probably a little bit t weary of uh, the week because we had a lot going on this week with life action and everything. And, and um, I am hearing, I have heard probably three major testimonies of good things that God has done. Uh, these are just things I know about, but three kind of like major breakthroughs in people's lives uh, as a result of life action being here. And uh, they're already on to their next assignment in Kentucky and they're serving the Lord right now. And... Um, I thank you for everyone who helped out with that. We are finishing up our series on prayer, and uh, you know we've always been told, or at least I have always been told, that a good pattern of prayer is is the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, talking about the, you know, as we as we go to God in prayer, to talk about His attributes, His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His sovereignty, His immutability means He never changes. So to, to adore God in prayer, to confess, see, confess sin, uh, to go to God and agree with him that the things that we're doing in our lives, if they fall outside of God's word, to agree with him that that's true. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving. Um, you know, uh, this is kind of a weird life that we live in. There's all kinds of nasty things going on. And it's, it's, it's a messed up world that we live in. And yet, what are our options, right? Our options are we can, we can let ourselves be drugged down by all of the bad things that are going on in this world, or we can be thankful to God, right? We can choose an attitude of thankfulness. Most of all, because of our salvation in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven, right? But also for the, the various blessings that we receive throughout the day. We live in the United States of America. Nobody in this room is going hungry or naked or cold. Um, and so... There's lots of things to be thankful for in this life, so we should ought to adopt a, an attitude of thankfulness. And then S, supplication. That's what we're going to talk about today. Supplication, making your requests known to God. Now, as I said earlier, one of the things, one of the features of this world that we live in, um, and, and now is a, particular, a particularly interesting time, is we've got tumult on the national or on the international scene right there's a war going on between russia and ukraine right uh, china is threatening taiwan uh, gaza the hamas folks have invaded or have uh, killed a bunch of israelis um, that number is somewhere in the 1200 to 1400 range it seems like they crossed the border and killed a bunch of innocent killed and brutalized uh, and took hostage many people, uh, peaceful Israelis. And now uh, Israel is engaged in a, in a war against Hamas in Gaza and other folks are joining in. It's getting bad. Um, cooler heads are not prevailing. It's, it's not good. And that's just what's going on on the international scene. On, in the, on the national scene, it's bad enough. We we cannot seem to agree with each other as Americans, like at all. Uh, we're, we're fractioning more and more into right versus left, extreme right, extreme left. Uh, it, it's, it's bad. We have a, an election coming up on Tuesday that if issue one passes, abortion in the state of Ohio will be legalized. 
up to the point of, of uh, birth. If issue two passes, uh, recreational marijuana, right, will become legalized. In Ohio. It's Ohio. Not only that, but, uh, you, you know, the, the church is fractured. The church, uh, we, we divide ourselves up into denominations and to different streams and all these kinds of things, and we can't seem to agree on much of anything. We'll fight over, um, we'll fight over uh, infant baptism versus believers' baptism. Uh, obviously, I, we 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 believe certain ways about that. We'll fight over Bible translations. We'll fight over anything. I used to, <clears throat> when I lived in Indiana, I belonged to an organization called IFCA, and some people used to joke that that means uh, I fight churches anywhere. <laughs> it's bad. Forget about international stuff. Forget about national stuff or state stuff. We've got issues going on in our own homes, right? We, we, there's sin in our own heart. There, our kids aren't always walking in the way that we would tell them to walk. And, and um, our marriages aren't perfect and, and they're strained at times. And it's a real, this life that we live in is rough. It's not for the faint of heart. And the, the thing that's polluting my heart, your heart, the world, the thing that's polluting it is sin, is this incessant need to, to not live according to God's way and to get what I want when I want it. That's what's messing up the whole, that's gumming up the whole works. It's making our whole world uh, bad. And it's a miracle, it's a miracle that, that we, just the few hundred of us that are gathered here and in the first service, that we, we don't agree on everything in this room, but what, here's what we do agree on. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, amen? Amen. amen? amen. We can agree on that. And we can decide intentionally to set aside our preferential differences to unify around the idea that Jesus Christ is our Savior, He's our Lord, and we are going to worship Him, and we are going to practice our faith in the context of this body and in this community, that's what we're going to do. It's a miracle that we can do that. And that miracle was wrought by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, something that we're going to remember here in just a few minutes around the Lord's table. But let's go back for just a minute to the, to the chaotic and tumultuous world that we live in. They say, they, meaning, you know, you read this on the news and print all the time, they say that, that we as a world, specifically we as a nation, are in the middle of a mental health crisis. And, and people are, you know, they're depressed, they're anxious, they're all these things, and they're, there's a lot of blame being assigned to social media, TikTok specifically. There's a lot of blame being cast out there in the world. But before we just start assigning everything to to someone else to the world tiktok social media just entertain with me for a moment right because the church and followers of jesus christ we have also not been immune to uh within the church there being depression anxiety and and, and a whole lot of things going on too but but hang with me here for a second if you will could it be that a big part of the mental health crisis that's facing our country and our world, the big part of the mental health crisis is that we are so saturated on a daily basis. We're just living in the stew of the chaos. We can't seem to wrap our minds around Russia, Ukraine. We can't seem to wrap our mind around Israel, Hamas. We can't seem to wrap our minds around the things that are going on, the corruption that's going on in our government, uh, the the you know, we can't seem to wrap our mind around the fact that we go to work every day, at jobs that, that are not necessarily all that satisfying, working with people that are kind of annoying to us. We earn a paycheck and we look at the paycheck and half of the money or a good chunk of the money is taken away in taxes 
to pay for things that we don't want in our communities. It can get depressing. And prayer is us every day for a minute rising, looking up out of the chaos and out of the, the, the craziness and the tumult of this world, the sinfulness of this world, and looking at the one who's not God. The one who's not full of chaos and tumult. The one who is perfect. The one who is holy. The one who is righteous. The one who never makes any mistakes. We get to go to him in prayer because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We get to go to him in prayer directly and talk to him. And talk to him about his qualities. And, and confess our sins to him. Knowing that in his grace and mercy he will take us where we are. He will forgive us of our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can express our thankfulness to him for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we can even, and this is mind-bending, supplication is probably the most mind-bending aspect of prayer. Because how does a feeble, sinful human being like myself go to a perfect, holy, sovereign God and say, excuse me, can I have something? And oh, by the way, I want it now. What does that even mean? That we can go to a perfect, holy, sovereign God, a God that we know has a plan for this life, for, he has a plan for our lives, he's, he's using us, and to go to him and ask for things. And yet, he tells us in his word to go to him, to come to him and ask for things. I would posit that besides all the other nonsense that's going on in this world of uh, social media and this TikTok specifically and, and you know, all the, the craziness, one of the reasons that we are in the bind that we're in is we are prayerless as a people. We are not taking the time on a daily basis to look up and to look to God, the author, the perfecter of our faith, and to say, you are holy, you are good, confess your sins, express thankfulness to him, and then to do that which he asks us to do, which is to come to him and make requests. The big question that we're going to wrestle with today is this, what is supplication and why does it matter? And I have an exercise for you, and I'm totally scamming this off of life action because I talked to Steve Canfield about it, and, uh, and uh, uh, he said uh, something along the lines of, you know, I'm not the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's working in each one of our lives, but sometimes I give people little exercises to do, and it's not me writing and filling in the blanks, it's them. So here's my question. As, just as a little exercise in your outline, what are the th top three things that you would say that you pray about on a, on, a, on a regular basis? What are the top three things you're asking for? Because that will reveal a lot about your heart, right? Now, I know that th this is probably not true, and I'm joking around a little bit, but uh, who in here is asking for the Maserati, right? The sports car, the, lotter the, the lottery ticket. I know you want to hit the lottery so that you can give all that money to the building program. I know. I get it. After you pay the 50% taxes and you got $10 left, you'll give it to the building program, right? But what are the things that you pray about? What are the things that you, when you go to God, what are you asking for? You see, we, when it comes to prayer, we tend to think about, this has been my observation, that we tend to think about making our requests to God in the following three different ways. Number one is we tend to see prayer as a means of control. You know, there's all these scriptures in God's word that talk about, you know, uh, Matthew, like Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Uh, we, we have this idea that if we come to God in faith and we ask him for things, he will give them to us. And so we get to kind of treat God as a, a little bit of a vending machine, right? We can make God do what we want when we ask him. We can ask him to save people and he will do it. And I don't know if that's right. I don't know if that's right. But this, this, these are the kinds of ways that I see that we tend to think about things. Prayer as a means, of, a means to a reward. In other words, there's, there's biblical scriptures that talk about, you know, that husbands, we are to, to live with our wives in an understanding way. We are to treat them respectfully so that our prayers will not be hindered. There's other scriptures that indicate that, 
you know, if we're, we're not walking in obedience to God, that, that our prayers will be hindered, that God won't hear our prayers. And so we read things like that, and then we think, okay, well, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to obey him, and I'm going to obey him, and I'm going to, and as a reward for obeying him, I'm going to ask him for something, and he's going to give it to me. I don't know if that's a good idea either. Have you ever, have you ever stopped, by the way, have you ever stopped when I, the whole, on the whole topic of obedience to God's word, have you ever stopped and considered that obedience to God's word is the blessing? In other words, our loving, tender, gracious, heavenly Father who created us, who looks down upon our sinful estate and gives us his word to live by, that us living according to his word is a blessing? For example, if you follow in, in Ephesians chapter 4, we always talk about the four rules of communication. You know, be honest, keep current, attack the problem, not the person. Act, don't react. We talk about the four rules of communication. Everybody that I know that's practicing those, those, those four rules of communication, whether it be with their spouse, their kids, their coworkers, their life group, whatever, they report back to me and say their relationships are much better. Or we think about prayer as a means of self-improvement. And here, this is probably not us so much, but I, here I, I think about the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel folks. The folks that read those passages of Scripture, and instead of asking for someone to be healed, if it's God's will, they instead will approach someone, lay their hands on them, and say something along the lines of, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed thinking that that's what's going to, that that's God's will in that moment. Or they think that, that uh, if we pray for, to God for wealth, that he will give it to us. By the way, um, nobody got this in the first service. There's a famous televangelist who uh, has a phrase. He, he's not like on the forefront of your thinking. Like he's, he's kind of in the background a little bit, but I used to see him on TV all the time back in the day, and uh, he reemerges from time to time. But anyway, his catchphrase is, you gotta pray that money to you. That's his catchphrase, you gotta pray that money to you. He uses it all the time. And uh, uh, I said, if you, if you can think of who that person is and tell me, you get, uh, you get extra pastoral dispensation. I don't know, you get something. <laughs> you get to, anyway. This is the way we tend to think about prayer. We're gonna, we wanna be in control, right? We wanna receive rewards for our obedience to God. We wanna make our lives better. And so we, we see that this is perhaps the way to do it. But from 1 Timothy 2, let's think about this a little bit this morning. As it, comes to, as it pertains to prayer, uh, what does it say? It says, um, well, let me get there. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people while it is fine it is okay to pray and ask God for things for yourself First Timothy 2 again Timothy is a young pastor in the church of Ephesus Paul is writing to him giving him instructions he says this when you gather <coughs> as a corporate body and you pray pray for all people so there's, a, there's an others focus here Pray for all people. He says, pray for kings and all who are in high positions. So when is the last time you prayed for the president of the United States? And it doesn't matter to me if it's Joe Biden, Donald Trump, or anybody else. When's the last time you prayed for our leaders? Something that we focus on in our prayer meeting on Wednesday night is we, we have a, a rolling list of national and state leaders, even local leaders, that we pray for. It is good for us to focus on the needs of others. And what are those needs? Well, primarily for salvation, right? If you love someone, if you truly love another human being, what is your number one desire for them? Is your number one desire for them that they would be well, that they would be rich, that they would be in, in a high position or a position of authority? Is that... Your number, if you really genuinely love someone, what you would want for that person more than anything else is for them to be saved. Look at what it says. 
First of all, I urge that prayers, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, all who are in high positions, that, they, that we may lead a peaceful and godly life and dignified in every way. Godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of our God who desires all people. Does God desire the President of the United States to be saved? He does. Who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Does God desire the, the senators of both the state and the United States to be saved? Yes, the, the House of Representatives, the dog catcher of Delaware County, everyone. Your next door neighbor, your best friend. God desires that all are saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, as it pertains to um, as it pertains to the world that we live in and the chaos therein I, I've noticed that one, that the world around us the unbelieving world is getting really triggered by the following phrase when something bad happens and a Christian says our thoughts and prayers are with you they do not like that they do not like that um, and, and why is that? Because they want action. They want someone to put in some legislation or some policy. They want justice. They want revenge. They want whatever, but they want something to happen. And so I just, this is a little bit of a side meditation for us this morning as we move through our time together. Okay, so you don't want me to pray to the sovereign God of the universe who has a stated desire that all men are saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You don't want me to pray to him on behalf of you and what's going on. Because what? You think that he, the one that spoke everything into existence, the one who sent his son to die, the one who is sustaining us on a moment-by-moment -moment basis is unable to do anything about the, the present circumstances? Who would you rather us ask and make our requests to? Government leaders? Yeah, because they are clean and pure as the wind-driven snow, right? Now, there are some good ones in there. We've got some in our congregation. But so many are given over to corruption, to lies, deceit, and if none of those other things are true, our, our government leaders are bound by the law. Our God is only bound by his own goodness in his character. He can do all things. So I don't, I don't, I get a little, I get a little irritated when people get upset by thoughts and prayers. Of course I'm going to take this in, to, I'm, of course I'm going to take this to God in prayer. He's the one that I trust that can do the right thing about it. All right, the third thing that we see in this text is that in order that peace may prevail. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, be, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet, a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let me ask you this. The things that are going on right now in Israel and Palestine, the things that are happening between Israel and Palestine. Do you think, let's be honest with each other here, do you think that, let's just go, to, let's have a mental exercise. Israel is going to go into the Gaza Strip. They are in the process of doing this now. And they are going to destroy every leader or member of Hamas. Once that's done, let's just say that they restore some semblance of peace and from that moment on everything is fixed right right no why because there's a whole generation of young people who have been brought up with the idea in that in that territory who have been brought up with the idea that the number one problem the number one thing that is oppressing them and holding them back from ever doing anything ever amounting to anything is Israel and that propaganda is making its way in our country as well into our universities into our places of of higher learning and even 
in government leadership, apparently. Okay, so 10, 20, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, Hamas uh, reestablishes itself or, or some other organization by some other name with a stated purpose of wiping Israel off the map and they gather strength, they gather weapons, they get some funding and they cross the border and they do, they, instead of killing 12 to 1400 people, brutally murdering, raping, pillaging, taking hostages, all these people, they go even further and they do like 5,000 or 10,000 people. Everything's fixed, right? Right? There's peace in the land because Israel's been shown that they can't do their... When Jesus rode into Jerusalem before he was crucified, you remember that he wept? You remember this? And what were the words that were on his lips? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Had you known that which makes for peace? We're not Hamas. We are not Israelis. We are Christians. And we ought to know that the solution to the problems that are facing Israel, Pal Israel, Palestine, whatever, and other places in the world. The solution to the problem is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because at some point, someone is going to have to say, I know what you just did, but because I'm forgiven all my sins in Jesus Christ, because of the filthy sinner that I was doomed and destined for hell but God who is full of truth and grace sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and now I have been given the forgiveness of all my sins I now turn and because he loved me first I can, now I can love I turn and I forgive you that's not the world that we live in at least not at, that, at this time in that location. And so we can pray for David Trubeck and missionaries that are trying to show Israelis the gospel. We can pray for those missionaries that are trying to show Palestinians and, and share with them the gospel. We can pray that God would, would get a hold of the leaders of both Israel and Israel Gaza, we can pray that God would do a transforming work in their lives. Let me read to you this passage again. First of all, I, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. The folks that are in Gaza, the folks that are in Israel right now are leading something that is far from a godly and dignified life. They are at war. And there's nothing dignified about that. So, the answer to the question today is this. Supplication is asking God for what we want. We should learn to ask for good things as God defines good. And the ultimate good, I would say, is salvation for people, right? We should learn to ask for God's timing as he sees and understands what we do not. We are so good at praying and praying and praying and, and wondering why God is not doing anything. God is listening. He has told us in his word that he hears every one of our prayers and that he is listening and he is working out his plan and his way. And so that's why you'll often hear me say, God this is what I'm asking for, but your will be done. I try to ask for good things. I try to conform my prayers to what, what I understand God's word to say that are good things, but I also have to trust God in the timing of those things as well. Now, before we uh, go and take up the Lord's, take the Lord's table, let me just uh, give a little bit of a series recap here on prayer. 
again, supplication is this really odd thing to me. Making a request of God is a very odd thing to me because I'm a broken, sinful human being. I have a very limited view of what's going on in this world. It it often feels like I'm helpless and I can't really do much of, of anything. But I serve a God who is sovereign, who is holy, who is perfect, and he does have perfect vision of what's going on. He's, he's got a perfect understanding of, of what will happen. And for, for little old me to make requests, because he tells me to, to make requests of him seems odd. And so this is another one of those situations where God's sovereignty and man's responsibility kind of come together and it starts to melt your brain down a little bit, doesn't it? So let me help you a little bit with that brain melt, right? The, the idea that we sinful human beings are going to be asking God, who is perfect, for something, for anything. Let me help you with that brain melt a little bit. First of all, just by, I'm recapping the whole thing here. The, the whole thing is prayer changes us by conforming our thoughts closer to God's thoughts, right? Prayer changes us. As we go through the process of adoration, as we look beyond the chaos and the messed up place that is this world, as we look to God, we, we think, we, we escape the here and now and we go to a higher, higher place. We think of God, think of salvation, think of eternity with him. And it changes us, right? As we go through the process of adoration and confession and thanksgiving and supplication, um, we are, especially as we're doing so according to God's word, we are, we are changing the way we're thinking. Instead of asking for making selfish requests, we're making requests for salvation. We're making requests for provision for people who need it. We're making requests that are in alignment with God's word. So it changes us. Prayer changes us. That's on the one hand. But here's the brain melting part that's the other hand. God has decided inexplicably, I don't I I wish, like with all of my engineering brain, that I could explain to you how this works, but my it I gray matter starts running out of my ears. I mean it just God has decided to work through us. To work through people. If you don't believe me, just think back to your own salvation experience. My wife, Tracy, who's had to work the early shift at the hospital today. My wife, Tracy, would testify to you that she was saved as a result of a Sunday school teacher at First Baptist Church in Francisville, Indiana, sharing the gospel with her when she was a very little girl. It didn't just appear in her head. She didn't just pick up a Bible, and, and she was, the gospel was shared with her through a person explaining God's word to her. God took that human effort and did a work in her life and saved her. I have a very similar testimony of the people that shared the gospel with me. And there was, uh, there was human beings involved, but also there was God involved, right? Because there was a, a point in time where I didn't believe, and then I did believe, and all I can, all I can attribute that to is God. God somehow chooses to work through you and me. Can we agree that, I know it's football season, this is a dumb example, but I'm using it anyway. It's football season, a lot of people in this room like to root for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Some of us like Purdue, but they stink at football, so not much you can do there. But can we all agree that when it comes to Ohio State football, there's a difference between being a fan of Ohio State football sitting in your easy chair, watching the game, and rooting on the Buckeyes. That's a good thing, right? Not a bad thing. But there's a difference between that and being on the team, right? Being on the team where you making a tackle or making a throw, or maybe you're a coach and you're coaching players, you are directly involved in Ohio State football. There's a difference between being a fan and being a player or a coach. In God's economy, he's decided to put us all on the team, which is wacky to me. It's bizarre. But somehow, God works through us. And so our prayers matter. Our our efforts to share the gospel, they matter. God will use them. And we ought to be about 
our Father's business. I'm going to ask the men that are going to help uh, serve communion, the Lord's table, to come up to the front. And uh, we're going to take a few minutes here and, and just wrestle with the following question, which is, what is the ground on which we can make these prayers? It's not like in the Old Testament where you had to appear with a, an animal and you had to go into the priest and make a sacrifice and the priest would uh, go into the holy place and on one day of the year, on the day of atonement, the high priest only would go into the holy of holies and make some sort of request to God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, which is what we remember around the Lord's table, that curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two symbolizing the fact that we all who are in Christ now have access to him directly in prayer will you take advantage of that reality will you make prayer a part of your daily routine will you escape the noise the nonsense the corruption of this world just for a few minutes a day and look at God Almighty who spoke everything into creation, existence, whose beauty surrounds us on a daily basis. Every time that we go outside, we, we see his creation. Who loves us so much that he did not, he did not reject us in our sin and our brokenness, but instead he sent Jesus to die for us. Will you make prayer a priority.